Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. This is Asia Tech Podcast. We are live on Twitter today. <laughs> That's first, so cool, actually. Yeah, first for us, Graham Brown, Michael Waits. Michael, how are you doing? I am doing super. You want to just jump right into this today? Let's do it. Yeah, let's roll. So today we were a little bit busy. I mean, we haven't really talked about this at all, but we're starting something new and we actually started doing it and we should start making it public now, but also start releasing some of the things that we've mm-hmm. been doing in, associ- in association with it, right? Yep. So we do Asia Tech Podcast and we decided to do another podcast. Actually, we didn't really decide. The market decided for us. I mean, how many yeah. people have asked us, can I please be on your show? Count. Right? Enough, the enough to start another podcast, right? Enough to start another podcast. Where And even today, I got from a guy I respect in Australia. He said to me, you know, we tweeted about, out about what we were going to be talking tonight, AR, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. And the guy just texted me right away. said, okay, you got you to gotta interview this guy, Scott O'Brien. Exactly. Yep. He runs this company called Humans. It's in Australia. It's this AR, VR thing. You've got to talk to him. And it's not the first time he's mentioned that to me. So thank you. Um, for that. But on this show, we don't. But on what we're now calling ATP stories, we will. Exactly. Because we, we don't have all the answers, do we? And there's a lot of people out there who are experts at their field, right? Yeah. And I think not only do they want to sort of share their thoughts and their expertise with people that are listening, but the listeners really want to hear people when they want to get into depth, right? Yeah. Not when they want to have like a, a less in-depth conversation, but they want to get real depth and real breadth on, on a certain topic. They want to listen to the people that are doing it every day, talk about it. And that's really the concept of ATP stories. And you know, the further idea is that there's a humanity inside of tech, and sometimes it gets lost. Yeah. And sure. by going out and talking to the people that are doing it every day, you want to get that human story as well, right? On that humanity side, what do you, have you felt the first fall that we've got down? expectations was it as you expected those first four stories we haven't published them yet but they're coming up how did I, you I feel actually, i thought they were really amazing and if you think about the four people that we interviewed all yeah. very different they're all involved in kind of a dis- different aspect and a different stage of the tech business right whether it's marketing or publications or training right all of these things are really important and the people that participated, and then, of course, the venture capitalists, right? So we get every angle of people yeah, yeah. that are in the, in the tech ecosystem, and that's the idea, right, is get everybody involved, all the stakeholders involved, get every perspective, and listen to their stories. And that's why we call it ATP Stories. So very excited about doing that. I know you are as well. And like, well, you know what, to, I, today, you know, I mean, I just want to add, because you, you mentioned venture capitalists. Today was like a... A one on one for me. I mean, I understand VC, but not to the level where you have two people who have been in the venture capital industry for the best part of their careers, right? Talking to each other. Right. Man to man. Yeah, I can only imagine what that sounded like to you because the two of us, you know, the, the two of us, right? And Michael and Michael, to be fair, um, we were having this incredible conversation and you were participating as well. It was really good. But you know, we were talking at exactly, you know, about the same things. And we actually ended up agreeing more than I thought we would. I thought he was really good, very well spoken. And I also thought he completely understood like his market. And yet, and I don't think he would argue with this characterization. He displayed a level of humility that I found very refreshing. And that is rare in his in his space. Now, he would never say that. But I think that it was clear that his humility was one of the things that made him so engaging and so compelling. And I thought that was great. Do they get a platform for that kind of thing? I mean, do venture capitalists get an opportunity to stand up and talk about their personal story? Not about, you know, what they did last night or whatever, but, you know, in terms of their story about the humanity, as you say, behind the VC. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I don't think often enough. And I think that's part of the reason for us to kind of create this platform is to give people the opportunity not to just be sort of robotic in side their own industries, right? Whether it's founding a company, whether it's advising companies, whether it's helping companies do online marketing, SEO, SEM, all that stuff, or literally like the investing is so difficult as well. Every aspect of this business is non-trivial and difficult. And I don't think people get, you know, people forget like, if you're a founder and you meet a venture capitalist, you forget that that day 
that guy's dog could have gone in for surgery or that his right. you know, daughter didn't get into the college she wanted to attend or you know, the, the nursery school that they were applying for somehow rejected their kid as there were too many kids. Like, you don't know that. And when you go meet them, you have to remember mm. there is a humanity everywhere. And you kind of have to cut some people some slack sometimes to understand that their lives are just as difficult from a different angle, maybe even from the same angle as yours. And having that um, empathy which is a word rarely ever used in, um, in the world of business. But being empathetic, I think, is really important um, in relation to success. Um, well, that's come up, been, right, that word. I know you say it's not used in business, but that's come up already. We did that with Simon Kemp in our first interview, right, talking about right. marketing. Yep. But that's the whole idea. Like a great marketer has to have empathy because yeah. they have to understand somebody else's situation. Anyway, so I'm very excited about this. I know you're super excited about it yep. as well. And remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to interview a lot of people, um, you know, trying to get a lot of these stories out. And the other thing we're trying to do in the context of this is we're trying to figure out who are the top 100 people yeah. in the tech startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia. And I would implore you know, listeners as well, if you know somebody that you think we don't know but that you think has significant impact, let us know who they are. We'd love to have them on. We'd love to hear their story. Exactly. Tweet us, Asia Tech Pod. You can use hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. You can connect with us on our website, asiatechpodcast.com. All the yeah, usual we're channels. With yeah, usual. We have a Facebook page as well, so go there too. Um, so let's just talk about something that's always been very interesting to me, and you know, for some reason we haven't gotten to it yet, but I think... What I really wanted to do, right, so in June this year, every year, actually, Apple has something called the World, Worldwide Developers Conference, right, shortened to WWDC. And, you know, with all the other announcements that they normally make, whether it's, you know, the, the, um, the Mac OS, which is what they started to call it, they stopped calling it OS X, and then the TV OS and the Watch OS and all these things that they generally update every year and talk about, you know, this year, iOS 11 is a big deal because after Apple taking so much flack you know, Apple's one of these companies that's always on the, the edge of doom, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's left over from the mid to late 90s when it really looked like Apple was going to go bankrupt. You know, when who was it? Mark Cuban famously said, what would you do if the CEO of Apple? He said, I'd, I'd give all the shareholders their money back and I'd shut it down. Mm -hmm. um, so people often like to quote that. But when Apple does something, right, they like to have it fully baked or as fully baked as possible. And they don't want to release stuff until they're ready, and they will not comment on it. So you can literally or figuratively stand outside of Apple's house <laughs> and tell them, you know, you're bad at this, you're bad at this, you're never going to catch Google or Microsoft or Facebook at this type of thing. And they're just inside squirreling away, like doing things that they think are relevant and important. And then, boom, they'll just drop it on you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they did with the iPhone. They did that with the iPad. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always behind until they're not. And, you know, they're famously, again, accused of never inventing anything, but just out there perfecting things. So similar to what the Japanese went through in the 80s. You guys don't, perf you guys don't invent anything. You just take things that other people have and make them smaller and better. And, you know, I would argue, what's the problem with that? Exactly. Anyway, so at, at WWDC, Apple came out with something that they're calling AR Kit, right? So they have Home Kit. They have all these pieces of software that are like APIs and um, development tools. And this is their augmented reality kit. And, and to be fair, it also mixes in some virtual reality. And probably if you have augmented reality and virtual reality, you have mixed reality by definition. And we should probably just define what those right. things are. Can we do right? that? I mean, so, augmented reality, virtual reality for the listeners. What, what is the difference? Well, so let's, let's do it in the, in the easiest possible order, right? So virtual reality is you literally... You know, you're sitting in your living room, you put on some glasses like Oculus or HTC Vive, Magic Leap we haven't seen yet, you know, the hollow, not the hollow lens because that's different, right? But you put on these glasses and you're just transported into a completely different reality. It's not, it's not real, right? And it's virtual in the sense that you're not really there, but it feels like you're there. So all this sort of sensory perception, it's almost like in the 70s they had this thing called um, surround sound or surround around, right? So when they had this movie you know, called uh, like what a volcano exploded, you, the theater would shake, right? Or towering inferno, you'd feel like you were in the middle of a flame. Like it was just weird the way they did it. Um, and with the glasses on, it's very immersive. You don't feel like you are where you are. You feel like you're somewhere else. And 
you know, the, that whole concept of virtual reality where you're not where you're supposed to be, you're kind of transported virtually to somewhere else, that's virtual reality. Right. So what's augmented reality? Well, augmented reality means, you know, you're sitting in your living room and you can see all of your furniture, your television, your air conditioners, your glasses, your table, all that type of stuff. And once you enter into an augmented reality world, you see things, let's say, like a cup that's not on your table, but it appears to be on your table. So this is more magical, I think, because, you know, you, you can literally, like, transport things that aren't here, mm. here. So, and we can talk about what, you know, how that type of stuff can be adopted and how powerful that can be. Because you're literally sitting on a real chair in your real room, in your real, um, you know, home. And yet there are things that you can see that look real. So not holograms, but like things that look like real physical objects. Right. That's the augmentation what, part. You are actually using the backdrop of reality, reality, right? You're not sort of changing it in any way, like replacing it with something else. You're putting right. objects in it. Right. Okay. So, and mixed reality is just a combination of both of those things. Mm -hmm. Right. In well, other words, you kind of get transported into a different place. But inside that different place, you can then add things to it that aren't necessarily really there. So your sensory perception is just really different. And to me, like virtual reality is interesting. It's interesting from a gaming perspective. Mm -hmm. But augmented reality is the thing to me that has the most potential. And we can talk about like how and why. But the reality is that, that <laughs> for lack of a better term, that Apple had been given a lot of flack for this because, you know, not just for months, but probably for years because, you know, people like to say that they were really far behind, but then, boom, they throw something out there, right? So Google famously announced, what, in the middle of last year, something called Google Tango. And again, it's really buggy software that sort of allows people using Google Box and some of the Android phones and stuff like that to create um, virtual reality and augmented reality stuff, right? But just like everything that Google does, and I'm not anti-Google, right? I use Google Mail. I, we use Google Docs for a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, Google Maps is amazing, but a lot of the software that they release is beta, hmm. right? And they're happy to announce it. They're happy to get in front of the market and do that type of stuff, but Apple's just not happy to do that. They'd rather have it come out either fully baked or close to fully baked, and Google doesn't care. Everything's in, in beta. Like Gmail was in beta for years before they finally took it off, and again, they're just testing how a whole bunch of things work, right? And the other problem for me with that is that Things like Wave, which was, you know, a combination of a whole bunch of different services in one piece of software that Google did, Google Plus, Google Glass. The problem is that once you commit to it as a software developer or even as a user, you can't have confidence that it's going to be around for that long. And it's the same thing with Tango. You just don't know, right? So it's hard for people to commit to it. Unlike ARKit, which clearly looks like it's going to have a paradigm change for all of the augmented reality stuff. And we can get back to why in a second. I just want to say like who some of the other competitors are, right? So mm -hmm. Oculus, who've been developing, you know, virtual reality stuff, big kind of clunky glasses, right? Uh, have you ever used that? No. I've seen people using them at shows and expos. So you've never tried like HTC Vive or any of the Samsung glass stuff? I've tried the Samsung glass stuff, right. And what do you think? Virtual reality. Yeah, you put it on, you're not really there, and then it looks kind of like you are there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my expectations were quite high, but I think if I went into it thinking, okay, right, here's a gaming simulation, that's cool. You know, I think that's fine. I think, you know, kind of like where we are maybe with, you know, online games in terms of like the, the level of graphics several years ago, right? Yeah, I don't think, you know, yeah. there's nothing groundbreaking in there yet. I've yet to see. I mean, I know it's an old phrase and I hate to bring it back up, but the killer application, you know, yeah, where there is one, right? No. Nope. And, and think about it. Like Facebook, if I won't ask you, right, because I don't like guessing games. But if I asked you when Oculus was purchased by Facebook and there was a ton of hoopla, right, and pageantry around this um, acquisition, I don't think you'd be able to guess when it was. And frankly, I couldn't either. So I had to go look it up. But it was over three years ago, oh. three and a half years ago, March of 2014, um, Facebook went out and paid over $2 billion, now almost $3 billion for Oculus, you know, a company that said was going to, again, create a paradigm shift in, in how we use social networks and how we did social interaction. And that may actually happen. 
But do what, you two see and a half that? years I mean, feels like a long time. Michael, do, no, you, do I you get? I mean, I can understand if Facebook went and bought an AI company for three billion because that sure. AI company can, you know, make their advertising more intelligent and more effective. But Oculus, I mean, when I you, you talk about Google, Apple, and so on, are these guys getting into AR, VR, mixed reality because they want to, or because the other guys are getting in there? What do you think? So that's the whole point, right? So. So Facebook goes out and buys Oculus, Magic Leap then magically announces that they're working on something that's like insane. And then in February of 2016, so again, almost a year and a half ago, Alibaba invests $793.5 million in it. They'd already raised another $600 million, right? So they've taken $1.3 something billion dollars of investment. Google does the Tango thing amongst a few other um, <clears throat> initiatives that they have. HTC comes out with the Vive which is a pretty close competitor to Oculus, right? It's supposed to be a gaming headset. Um, and are you still there? And, still here. Yeah, sorry. And and then that doesn't even mention Sony, right? But here's the biggest problem with any of these. Well, there's multiple problems with them. But no one's going to walk around in the real world, right, with a gigantic set of goggles on, like ski goggles. It's just not going to happen. I don't care how amazing the reality is, the virtual reality is just not going to happen. That's first of all. Second of all, the installed base for those things today is is de minimis, and the um, the experience isn't isn't that great. And it's all different too, right? So the Oculus runs on a different thing. Magic Leap is completely different. Tango is a different platform. Vive is different, and the Sony product is is um, is tied to the PS4. Along with Microsoft also does some stuff, right? So we talked about HoloLens earlier, which is kind of a mixed reality, augmented reality pair of glasses. And all of these things are supposed to be amazing. But for my money, and again, you and I don't spend a lot of time talking about Apple. It's more kind of sort of a US-centric thing. Mm -hmm. But I believe that there's going to be some huge uses for this <clears throat> in things that are very specific and sort of groundbreaking and, and leading edge in Asia that, um, that are going to happen here first, I believe. And then mm. let's just talk a little bit about that. Let's right? do it, yeah. Like what? So what would those well, use cases be? Well, let's back up first and think about this. If I asked you, and I won't again, but if I asked you how many pairs of, like how many PS4 sold, and then how many of them sold with Sony's version of those glasses associated with it, you wouldn't know, but you know it's right. not a billion. But you mm. know it's not a billion, right? But if I asked you how many iPhones or iOS devices are out there in the wild, it's probably pretty close to a billion. Yeah. It's hundreds of millions for sure. I mean, I can look it up, but it's not really that relevant. The point is that when Apple comes out and introduces AR kit and says that they're going to take it out of beta and release it, right, in probably November or sometime before the end of this year, this is going to have a huge impact. And in Southeast Asia or in Asia, right, you know, in China, in India, in ASEAN, also in Japan, where mobile phone penetration, and we talk about this a lot, right, is over 100%, mm -hmm. and smartphone penetrations in the 70s and 80s, you, you're talking, and where everybody's introduction to the internet is mobile, you're sitting here seeing a whole bunch of people get ridiculously excited about the types of things that they can do with this in Asia, because it's very specific to Asia. So let's have, let's take a second and just talk about this, right? And we'll talk about this in other contexts as well. But travel, right? You and I spent an hour talking about travel and travel technology a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Let's just go over some of those statistics again and see why this is really important, not just for AR, but for the whole suite of reality um, products. 1.2 billion people traveled last year. 1.2 billion people. Only about 3.5 billion people in the world kind of live in a modern technologized right. way. And a third of them got on a plane and went somewhere last year. Mm. And 110 million of them came here. 110 million of them came to ASEAN. And we know as well, if we were listening last time, that global travel grows about 4% a year. And it grows about 8% a year in Southeast Asia. So it's doubling the growth, right? And imagine this too. In Asia, we have the Olympics coming up in Japan. A lot of like super high-tech stuff is developed in Japan. Um, Apple has a gigantic um, market there as well. And they have 20 million tourists this year. They expect to have 40 million tourists by the mm -hmm. time the Olympics are in 2020. You know that because, like, you live in Kanagawa. And exactly. while it's not Tokyo proper, boy, you'll see everything change there over the next few years in preparation. You're already seeing massive construction on the old Olympic site, right? Yeah, it started. But just, but just think about what, what 
artificial, I mean, what augmented reality, what the impact is going to be on travel, right? So that's real travel, meaning it's actually going somewhere. But let's say, right, you are going somewhere or you are somewhere. And let's forget about the whole Pokemon Go thing, Mm -hmm. which literally swept the entire planet for like a month or so. Is that part of this conversation? Is that, can somebody say that is augmented reality? Completely augmented reality. I want to find a monster, right, or a Pokemon thing behind a tree. Okay, good. So I just understand that that is in the box of augmented reality, right? For sure. And everybody's done it, right? I mean, or a lot of people have done it. And, you know, the tree is there, but the monster is not really there, right? Yeah. And And they're still doing it. It's still going on here. Yeah, it's still going on. And I mean, there are actually stories of people like getting hit by cars and stuff like that because they they were too busy looking for monsters and not so busy watching whether cars were coming. Hmm. Listening to their mother's advice of look both ways before you cross. So how does that how does that sort of translate into travel? I can see it. Yeah, I can see the obvious application of a game in the real world. Travel. Well, just so think about the other part of augmented reality is think about what Snap and we'll get to travel in a second. But think about what Snapchat does, mm-hmm. right? Or think about what Line Messenger does. If you use Line or if you use Snapchat, you're constantly like changing what your face looks like with simplistic sort of cartoon style yeah. augmentations. Right, but imagine actually being able to take – because this is what's going to happen. You're going to have your phone in your hand, and you're going to see a fish or a boat or something. You'll be able to take a picture of that boat, and you're going to be able to augment your own reality by placing yourself on that boat necessarily and then sending that picture around the world. You can only do that, right? So, Or if you're standing like at the base of Mount Everest, you can do a whole bunch of photos and augmented pictures of you actually – being at base camp, even if you're not there, all these types of things that you can do when you're traveling and, and it runs the whole gamut, right? You can take a picture with people that aren't with you. You can augment reality by being at the Eiffel Tower or being at the Tokyo Tower, or being at the top of Mount Fuji. And let's say your girlfriend or your mother or your brother is back in Connecticut. You can augment them into that picture by, by doing that. But also think about this too. You know, right now when you're traveling, you get on Skype or you get on, you know, Zoom meeting or some type of, um, you know, phone call like that. But imagine if you could use augmented reality, right? So there are sensors in somebody's house. You use the sensors on your phone to make it feel like when you're having that conversation, you're not watching a video of them. But when you're away on business or when you're away on vacation, you can virtually transport that person who's either close to you or you're arguing with, it doesn't matter into the space where you are. That's an unbelievable way to do augmented reality. It makes you feel like somebody's there. And the, the, um, the possibilities for this are, are endless. Hmm. Right? Just I, kind of, ad- I kind of think it's a bit Star Trek, though, no? I'm going to play. I'm going to bat for the other side here. Yeah? I think that's a bit Star Trek. I'm trying to think. I, can, I get the Pokemon, stuff, and I get, I mean, would you say, for example, even you took something like Google Photo Translate, you know, where you can... Mm-hmm. The Google Translate service on your mobile phone, you could walk up to a sign in China or Thailand in the local script and you can just show your phone and it will, you know, it will convert the letters as you look at it, right, through your yep. camera. Mm-hmm. That would class as augmented reality. I can see those sort of very basic functional applications. Sure. Even to the extent where you say you walk out and look at the sky at night, you hold your phone up and it tells you, okay, that's that star, that's that planet. I get yep. that. But the other stuff that you talk about, I kind of like, you know, I'm lost on that. I've kind of heard that sort of stuff with, you know, when people talked about picture messaging in mobile telecommunications a few years ago. They said, oh, you know, you're going to have this situation where, you know, you're going to be driving along and these kind of like cute fluffy ducks cross the road. And you're going to jump out and take a photo of these fluffy ducks and send a picture. Oh, this is a Nokia commercial I can remember. <laughs> to your right. boss or to your girlfriend and st- that kind of thing. But people didn't actually do that. And they kind of like went and did the very functional stuff. So I'm just trying to sort of see it from the other side. I think the stuff that you talked about, the really exciting stuff that people will use to sell the top technology, but people, when they come down to using it, it's going to be the really sort of, I would say mundane. You were going with mundane though. I'm going to go with mundane. I'm, I'm, I'm into are. mundane. I think mundane is exciting, if that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going to, I'm going to throw that out there just to be contentious, but. Yeah, no, and I look, you and I do this all the time, right? Like we in the context of, you know, food delivery, you don't care. You just want a drone to come to the thing. I want some I want some person to come to my house and actually have a conversation with me about my pepperoni pizza. So, you and I do you and I do disagree on this stuff and how this tech will be implemented. Here's what I'll say. 
if I went to you in 1972, or if you and I were like sitting in my living room or sitting in the basement watching, you know, Star Trek, we had Captain Kirk and Spock and Sulu and all those people. One of them went down to the planet, you know, whatever it was called, Scorpion 9, I can't remember. And they had that little communicator with them that kind of flipped open. And I yeah. said, people will be carrying this stuff around in like 25 years. You would have told me I was insane too. And that that was kind of a, you know, it was just kind of a sci-fi thing that no one was ever going to do. And yet there we were 25 years later carrying flip phones that had GPSs in them. We knew where each other's were and then we could do video phones on them. So I just don't think it's that far away. And I think we, we lose, we lose sight of the fact that, um, that all that stuff is technically possible and just finding the right use for it. Right. And remember all, remember sensors are shrinking too, right? So even a year ago when I first started or two years ago when I first started looking at the augmented reality and the virtual reality stuff, you could, you could already do in test, right? You had a room with these four kind of towers. They looked like big Bang & Olufsen speakers, mm. right? And as long as you stood in the middle of them, those sensors knew where you were and they could draw like a three-dimensional picture of you. And if you had cameras in the right place and the right equipment, it could actually put you in a room in another place using augmented and virtual reality. So that tech was there. But fast forward a few years and everything gets miniaturized really quickly, right? And if you think about all the artificial intelligence, all of the way to like change voices, you see this happen in, you know, um, who does this? Uh, they do, fo- you know, fake phone calls between President Trump and Vladimir Putin and the voices sound really good even though you know they're not the real person's voice and the same thing with Obama and Trump. Like all that kind of stuff gets to be closer to reality than you think. And I think when you're traveling, you know, if you're – sick grandmother isn't there with you, but you kind of want to make them feel like they are. I think the ability to do that sort of sensory perception stuff through augmented reality, even just for things like vacation, definitely going to be possible. And I think they're definitely going to be used. There's a whole, there's a whole group of people that for multiple reasons, whether it's time or resources or um, handicaps, right, that cannot travel in the same way that we take for granted, and imagine them being able to do the reverse, right? So instead of actually going somewhere and using augmented reality, how about augmenting and virtualizing themselves to the, you know, to the top of the Eiffel Tower and actually seeing what it looks like to stand up there, but just not being there. So seeing like a live view, a 360 degree view of being in Paris and looking down at the, you know, L'Arc de Triomphe and all that kind of stuff, that's, I think, is definitely going to be used and I think it's going to get used both ways. I did see the other day um, an article in the news they had given these guys who were in the one of the final battles in World War One in Belgium augmented sorry virtual reality headsets, and they, they go back to the yeah yeah and these so these guys I mean what age would they have been they must have been a hundred right they At must least have been it's World War One yeah, yeah right right so this was 1916 1917 wow. right one of the final trench battles of World War One and they gave these guys headsets to to actually relive. The, the landscape, and the, you know, I mean, it's just phenomenal. I mean, you know, yeah. these guys could get it. But I, I get that part, right? But I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think that the real growth area, the real, you know, it's kind of like messaging, isn't it? It's like, can we have all that technology on the phone? But how do people actually spend their time when it's sending basic text messages, whether that's on line or WeChat or whatever? That's the majority of it, right? That has all yeah, the other stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, you and I just have a different opinion on this. I really think that I think that's super because everything that seems sort of fantastical today just becomes like common practice two years down the track. And maybe I'm wrong. Look, I'm not always right, right? But it's fun to talk about. And I, I think that the excitement for me is in the things that you can't do today, but you can conceptualize and the ability to do that stuff and travel, I think, is maybe the first Maybe not the first wave, but definitely going to be one of the first waves of this, right? And we can talk about other ways to use this, right? So, again, we you can go back and listen to our podcast about um, medicine and medical tourism, right? Right. There you, you can go. Yeah, definitely, right. You can definitely see a use for, for, sure. for that, right? So, but, but, again, this is something that's much more likely to happen, right, in – in Asia and in Southeast Asia, where medical care is a third the price or half the price that it is in, in the Western world, and yet the quality is just as high. Um, and, and you can separate the distance. You can do all of these things, right, diagnostic things that you couldn't do before because now you don't just have like a video phone, but you can have all these sensors on your phone that can send feedback to a doctor somewhere else. It's like the doctor is with you. Mm. 
you can do virtual um, operations, you can do virtual testing in um, in the medical space, and you already see companies, right, like Ring MD, whose entire business or a lot of their business is built around you're not in this location, but the expert that you need is in that location. Get on the phone, you know, get on whatever communication tool you have and talk to them from far away. And if you add some augmented reality to that, right, so the doctor can project something onto you to tell you exactly where to right. look. We can make it feel like if you're doing hair removal, I'm just looking at my arm, right, so I know that's silly, but something really simple like that, you can see what it would look like. If, if the hair is not there after an operation or let's say you were in an accident, right, and you need to reconstruct your face and there's one doctor in the United States working with a doctor in Bangkok about how to do that reconstructive surgery, and you can use augmented reality to do that. I just cannot be led to believe that that type of stuff is not going to happen and that it's not going to happen in, in Southeast Asia just because of the, the way that, you know, you get the leapfrog stuff. We talk about this too, right? So the tech that gets implemented here in a hospital like Bumangrad or Santive, um, is just going to be streets ahead of a hospital that's you know fifty or sixty or hundred years old in New York. Not because it's better, but just because they just buy whatever equipment they do when they that's there when they open the hospital. They're not buying used stuff, and you add augmented reality into that, and I think you're talking about an amazing change in people's ability to get medical care, and you add that onto medical tourism, and I think. It's a really is that an area where you're going to see it first? I mean, you know, if you had to nail your colors to the mast, what areas would you see it in first? You know, is, are you talking about things like medical, medical tourism, medicine? Is that where you see augmented reality, virtual reality first sort of getting traction? No. So I'd see, and I'm, I'm kind of going in just the order that I thought about it, right? But I think it's entertainment and games and education. Right. Like those are the three places because it's really easy to do. You know, you can sit in the – so right now – you can sit in a classroom in, in Bangkok and you can have somebody in England teach you how to speak English. Mm. And you know, right, you're sitting here with headphones and there's one person teaching, let's say, 15 people, even if it's across the world. But imagine being able to use augmented reality to have that teacher sitting in front of you. It's just so much more powerful than having somebody sit on a screen. You're sitting on your chair, they're sitting across the desk at you. And that image is where the sound and the voice comes from, even if it's even if the voice, let's say, is necessarily coming from right? because you could build speakers into the wall. There's so many different things you can do to augment that reality, not just on your phone. But that type of stuff, I think, is going to change the way people learn. You don't necessarily have to be at Oxford, hmm. right, or at the Sorbonne or at or at Tokyo University, right or at Chula to learn from a teacher that's there if that's the best professor in the world for that particular topic. And if you can do that in an augmented way, right? Not necessarily virtual. It's not like you're in Bangkok or you're in England when you're taking that class, but it feels more like there in your living room. The power of that, I don't think, can possibly be explained, right? And we already see it in entertainment, right? So Avatar was probably the first, um, the first swipe at this. Even though it was just 3D, you kind of what they were trying to do was kind of make you feel like you were into that world. And entertainment is the place where this stuff always gets implemented first because it's something that's kind of easy to do, right. and the quality doesn't have to be that high, right? And I would add games in with that too, right? So we see all these things like the Vive, the Sony product, um, even the Pokemon Go ends up being something that is sort of entertainment, ba- entertainment and sort of gaming based. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the place where you're going to see this happen. Let's talk about that a little bit, right? So one of the most, and, and, and that's going to happen in Southeast Asia too. So one of the most famous and successful um, game companies in Thailand had been invested, went through its series A, grew, distributed their games all over the world. It was a company that was originally called Pocket Play Lab, right? And, it, and then changed, shortened its name to Play Lab, but very successful with games like Juice Cubes and stuff that people have heard of, all iPhone-based or you know, phone-based games. And recently, they sold that company to another startup in Thailand, another very successful um, business here called Chilindo. And one of the founders, so one of the founders, you know, stayed in the gaming business, went to his studio in the Philippines and continues to build games and mobile games because it's just his passion. And Jacob, who's the other one of the other co-founders, decided to build a virtual reality and an augmented reality studio. And this is a guy who has been very successful at kind of picking trends before they're trendy, if that makes any sense, mm-hmm. right? So he got into the mobile gaming space when everybody was doing Facebook games. He was right. The Facebook game people were wrong. He turned that into a very successful career. And, f- and frankly, prior to that, 
he did something called Page Mundo, I think. I can't remember the name of it. But again, he built something that made it very easy for people to interact with Facebook and do some stuff like that. And that was actually bought by Facebook, I believe. But again, he's way ahead of this stuff, and he sees this augmented reality and virtual reality stuff um, as like the operating system of the future. And then to be fair, I don't necessarily disagree with him. And you see a lot of activity, not just in Thailand, obviously, but in the whole region around these types of things. And I think the people that come out of the game and entertainment industry are going to be, people, going to be the people that lead this because that tends to be the way that yeah. this type of technology gets implemented, no? Yeah, you've got the captive market, haven't you? That's, it's easier for them to convince gamers to pick up a new headset or to try something like that. I think it's a lot easier than getting your average person in the street to try it out, right? Yeah. You know, gamers get it. They can see it. It's just an extension. So, uh, you know, if you have that base already, I mean, it's interesting that he's gone into that space specifically to do that. Yeah, I think so. You know, I that's going to really be interesting. interesting. Yeah, I mean, is, so, he, is he doing it for is he doing it for smartphones? Like, I mean, what he was doing games before, is he actually building it for these headsets? I mean, how's that working? I, I don't know the answer to that question. He's literally just introduced a new business. He said he introduced this last week that he had sold his that he had sold his um, game studio, and he's now <clears throat> using part of his last name. He's calling it LikeStudios.com, and it's really just a landing page right now for an idea he has to move into the virtual reality, augmented reality, and I would guess the mixed reality space as well. And I think. I think he's agnostic to platform, but I haven't had a chance to talk to him about it yet. I will do that so we can revisit it. But again, it's just the idea that there's somebody out there who sees this as, the, as a real way to go and he comes from a gaming background. And I don't think that's, I frankly don't think that that's like a really big surprise. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing too, again, just to, just to give a, another sense for what's going on in, in Asia. So again, based in Bangkok, but just kind of accidentally, You've got an entire Facebook page with hundreds, if not a thousand people um, associated with it, right? That's just a mixed reality VR, AR, just in Bangkok, right? So the idea is that this is a kind of ongoing, constant discussion, and they actually do weekly conversations about this in person, which is interesting in and of itself, to just get people out there sharing information, talking about how they're approaching it, and building things that are associated with augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality. What's this, Michael? So Jeremy Tissot, right, runs something. It's a Facebook right. page. Okay. It's called, it's just... Um, I wonder if you a, had the actual link, because that would be quite useful. Or we could throw it in the yeah, show notes, absolutely. right? I do, and I, I have the link. It's in the notes that we've already made. And if you just you'll look it up, or you just click on it, you can see, because there's a whole group of people here that are super interested in this space. And, you know, these are all developers and gamers and people like that. These are going to be people that are early adopters as well. And I think that's what's going to happen here, right? Well, let's just back up a little bit and talk about um, – so education and training too. Sorry, I didn't spend any time on this. But, you know, we were talking to Michelle Cadix this morning, right? And yeah. Michelle runs a very robust sort of um, risk-facing and banking-facing you know, training and sort of a gamified training business in, in Southeast Asia, but again, um, appropriate for the rest of the world. And we, even when we were on the phone with her this morning, I couldn't stop thinking. We didn't have a chance to, to touch on this with her, but how do you incorporate the augmented reality and the mixed reality into these training sessions, right? So how do you, because she talked about simulating risk and simulating the experience of building a portfolio um, of existing loans and, and, and outstanding stuff. And how do you simulate that and she did talk about simulating it in, in like kind of a real-world environment. Mm -hmm. But again, imagine if you can't do that or if you're at home, you want to do this after work hours, if you can simulate that by using augmented reality either on your phone or on your laptop or some other piece of technology, that's going to be, again, another paradigm shift in the way this training takes place. And then you allow this to happen globally. But she's working on this in Singapore. And, you know, it's a huge banking center, and I think there are potentially a lot of clients to test this stuff out there. And, again, I think the education and training, like I said earlier, you don't have to be at Oxford. You don't have to be at Stanford, and you don't have to be in Michelle's office or in any particular place or even with your colleagues to go through this training. And to the extent that you could add, you know, a virtual reality or an augmented reality piece to it, I think that's really powerful too. Right. So the, the premise there, I mean, this is a lot of what you're saying with virtual reality, especially with the education stuff. And you mentioned it with the medical tourism as well, is that the main premise 
is that effectively you're just bringing people together who are in the same place, right? I mean, there may be extra stuff that you could add to that, but you could put a doctor in the same room as a patient. You could bring two teams together from different departments in a bank. That seems to be the main driver for something like this. I mean, yes, there's stuff that you could add into that simulation, right? Or that education. But that is the main value add for that technology. That's what it does. It basically makes geography and distance no object. It's irrelevant. Right. It, it again, it disintermediates that that sort of time and space compendium because in in the end it doesn't really matter. So imagine this too, right? So in the old days, you'd call somebody's house, and the phone would just ring off the hook, and then there was an answering machine, and there was a little tape cassette in there, and you'd make a message before you left. You know, Graham is not available right now. He's out of the house. Please leave your name and number, and he'll get back to you as soon as he returns. You know, and then you could dial into that thing from outside the house, and you could get your messages when you were away, and now you have mobile phones and you're always <clears throat> connected. But imagine if you could leave, you know, so now even on Skype, you can leave a video message or an audio message for somebody. But imagine being able to leave an augmented, real, an augmented reality message for somebody. Like what? Where they literally get to see you, right? Like, hey, mom, we live in completely opposite time zones. So at, at you know, noon for me, it's midnight for you and just calling you and showing you the baby. Hmm is impossible unless you come out, but you've been in a wheelchair for six months and it's impossible for you to come out. But let me show you or augment your reality by putting the baby like in your arms. Mm. I just think that all that stuff is going to be possible. But how could you do that though? I mean, haptics, could, I mean, there's so right, many ways. Okay. So, so much... haptics, you're going to have to wear gloves and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's what I wonder about. Yeah, but maybe, I mean, cause there's actually, there was a story last week or the week before about Apple actually building headphones. Mm -hmm that are so powerful, right, to these air buds that they have. And I think this is part of augmented reality, where it's so, the sound is so powerful that people that have been considered deaf for a long, very long period of time, mm -hmm. they, you, they're building technology, you can implant these things in your ears, and you can hear. So there's no reason why you cannot build, and again, this is not three years away, maybe it's ten years away, but I'm, I'm as you know, I'm ridiculously bullish on human's ability to take technology and just develop it so fast. Mm. And I think if you want to create an augmented reality um, environment where haptics or some future version of haptics and that whole feeling and then sound can be completely surround sound and presence will be possible, you're just not going to be able to separate the difference between reality and augmented reality. And you just won't be able to tell. Right. So you can think about really um evil uses of this technology but in my mind it's it's i think those are edge conditions right like you could create yeah. thievery where you have two people in a room and one of them's like neither one of them are real and one of them is like robbing the bank and the other one's just distracting you but i think more the better use of this is you know sitting with the baby mm -hmm. and look there are articles there are articles about this um and books about this out there right so i posted on our blog yesterday the day before something about virtual reality and Ready Player One. And I just recommend that everybody reads this. It's a really interesting summary of a book written by an author named Ernest Klein. And the whole concept is that VR and AR is just going to be readily acceptable and, and available for, for sort of mass consumption. And I just don't think it's that far away. And there's so many places to use it, as we've already talked, and I don't think we've touched on you know, half of the potential examples, right? These are mm -hmm. just things that popped into my head, but I think there are way more uses of this technology than we can conceptualize or we can at least talk about today. For sure. I, I want to throw something at you, Michael. Ask see, see if this has got any legs, and you'll see why I say legs in a minute. It's that, uh, the other day, I took my son here in Tokyo to an open day, and it was an open day about robotics, specifically <laughs> aimed at robotics for the elderly. Obviously, it's wow. a big issue here in Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, artificial intelligence, robotics for mobility, those kind of things. And a lot of the equipment there was made by a company called Cyberdyne, which is like one of the leading robotics companies here in Japan. We talked about it on our previous show about artificial yep. intelligence. They make those exoskeleton suits, which is sort of something that it's not really what you kind of think it is. It's a very loose suit, a very you know basic construction that sits around your hips. And it can kind of model and power your, your movements, right? But here's the interesting thing, right? The way it powers your movements is... They, they made him wear this thing, right, to try it out. And at the beginning, you kind your of... Your son. 
Yeah, they made him wear it, right? Well, they, they didn't say they made him wear it. He volunteered to wear it. Right? Right, didn't force it to him, but, but it's necessary to wear, yeah? Right, so you can wear this thing, right? And you, you train it because it basically pits up on nerve sensors from your brain. So like, if you want to make a movement in your knee, there's a certain nerve sense that happens, a, a current or a frequency in your brain, and that makes your knee move, right? Right, right. So what you can do is you can train yourself after a number of attempts, and it creates you know, this sort of powered movement. And you can also replicate that. So if he was to move, he could have a robot on, across the room that could then replicate those movements. So I'm just kind of thinking about that experience, what we're talking about here. What's the opportunity there where you could have a situation where somebody could be powering something in a different place? I don't know. Where can we go with that? Well, I mean, coal mining. Do you know what I mean? Or fire people. I don't want to say firemen, but, you know, people that work extracting people from burning buildings or you know, getting animals off ledges and all of that type of stuff. You know, imagine all every emergency technician could, you know, be serving people or doctors that could be doing surgery. There are just so many ways you could do this as long as it has the subtlety of movement of a human and we're not that far away from that as well. Even if the robot itself didn't even know what it was doing, if a human could control it, right? So you mm. get into the exoskeleton suit, which, believe me, in five or ten years is really just going to be you using your thought power, like you said, you can use your brain to train it, to understand how to control it. The reality is, right, that that when you want to move your left arm, just as a fully functioning, you know, non sort of handicapped person, you don't tell your brain, you don't say, okay, Graham, I'm going to move my left arm. You just do it because yeah. all of the sort of all of, all of the equipment inside your brain and your body just knows how to do that. And frankly, you trained it, right? Because you had no motor skills when you were born or limited ones. So you just trained yourself over time to do it. So it's not that far out of the realm of imagination to understand that if, if, I, if I'm an insanely great surgeon with super subtlety of movement, I could literally be in Connecticut and operating on somebody in Tokyo. Mm. I don't see that that's, I don't see that that's an impossibility. That's not virtual reality or augmented reality. But again, you're using super advanced technology to put somebody in a place where they aren't really there and using robotics and software to facilitate that. I don't think that's that, that that is that far away either, to be fair. That scenario you said about with the, you know, like first responders or fire services, yeah. you know, when you talk about somebody who's not there, well, talking about a situation where they couldn't be there, like, you know, right. going into a burning building or like, you know, like Fukushima reactor, yep. right? Yep. Sending I'm people gonna go in. there too. Yeah. You know, that would be, you know, you combine virtual reality, augmented reality with artificial intelligence and robotics. You've got something quite amazing. Yeah. And again, I don't even think we're touching the surface of scratching the surface of what the possibilities are. Right. But imagine a scenario where it looks like a building is going to just fall down. Right. You know, and, you're, and a relative of yours is in there and you know they're going to die or they're being asphyxiated. And, and it's past the point where like a fireman or a fire lady can go in there and get and extract them. But the robot's not going to die because it's impervious to heat. It doesn't need to breathe. Mm -hmm. And if that, if that robot has a camera on it that's directly connected to your eyes, it can see things that you can't see because it has infrared vision or night vision. And it doesn't care if that building falls down because it's not going to die. So it doesn't have fear. You can literally walk throughout that whole building, um, find the thing or the person or the animal that you want to extract and get them out. And it's just like, it's heroics left and right. And I think that type of thing. So, cause we can have a dystopian future, right? Where all of this machinery is used for war, right? I don't, yeah. I don't want to fight these guys, but I'm just going to go over and start blowing up buildings. And you, know, you just manufacture and manufacture until everybody, until everybody's done manufacturing things. And frankly, that will happen. Like it's, I don't want to, well, that's about happening it, with happen. drones, right? I mean, it's sort of that yep. remote war, isn't it? I mean, you just yep, apply there. We're there, right? It's already happening. Right, and again, that was you know Tom Tom Clancy, the sum of all fears. If you read that twenty five years ago, the end of that book ends with a whole series of unmanned flying vehicles. So people have been considering this for a while, right? Mm. Um, but the one thing that people hadn't been considering is all the great stuff that people can do. Um, they're going to be positive as opposed to negative. And I think that you add the augmented reality stuff in there, even for training, right? So think about now you're in a flight simulator. Right, you're literally mm. sitting on the ground. But if you can augment reality and use virtual reality to actually put somebody in a place where it really feels like they're going to crash into a mountainside and they have to sort of fix that, that's way more powerful than just the simulators that they have today. So there are plenty of ways to use this, mm. and plenty of people out here 
Southeast Asia, but in all of Asia that are super interested in this. And, you know, with all the commitment that governments, not just um, in this region, but in China and India are putting to artificial intelligence and machine learning, because that's going to be really important when it comes to augmenting reality. You're going to see a lot of that stuff, I think, getting deployed or at least created out here before it gets created mm-hmm. in other places. And it fills a lot of gaps, doesn't it? Like we talked about, you know, yeah. even if you go back to our episode about autonomous vehicles, you can see it happening there, right? You can see that playing a role that you have to have, in some cases, a human being at some point in a car or a vehicle because they may be needed where a robot can't make a decision. You can fill that gap, right? With Yeah, I mean, and watch this. So you just gave me an idea that I hadn't thought of before we, before we started talking. Let's say you're at your hotel on Scumbit Road. And you want to go to, and you're a tourist, right? And you want to go to dinner in Tonglor, and you have five restaurants that you want to choose from. You have not made a reservation. Imagine you're sitting in a driverless car where all of the internal environment of that car can now be changed into either augmented or virtual reality. And you say, tell me what it looks like inside of, um, you know, pick a restaurant. Don't care. Divino. Tell me what it looks like outside. Seat me down there and tell me if it's too crowded, too hot, too noisy, understaffed. And you can say, no, I don't want to be there tonight because the vibe's not right. And then you say, oh, let me, let me see what the oyster bar is like. That's over in Naratiwa. Let me see what that's like. And you go there. It's empty for some reason. But they've got three lobsters left over. You don't have to call anybody or talk to anybody. You can just see what's in the restaurant. Like that type of stuff is so powerful. And no one's really talking about that yet. And I think if, if you can augment reality that way, <laughs> again, we get back to autonomous cars. But that type of stuff to me is fascinating. Mm. And I don't th- again, I don't think any of it's that far away. Yeah, and there may be a point as well where we just stop calling it augmented reality, right? That it just becomes, I don't know, maybe that's where, you know, when they say like technology becomes a successful technology when it becomes invisible. I've sort of hackneyed the phrase a little bit, but something along those lines, isn't it? That, you know, we won't talk about it anymore as virtual reality or augmented reality because the lines have become blurred. Yeah, you just say, look, what does it look like in Divino tonight? And just having a conversation, just, you're just there. You're like, "Mm, I don't like it here tonight. Or you go see live music, but you're not really there. You're like, I don't feel like being here. Let's just turn it off and go home or go to sleep. <laughs> Done. Easy to do, right? And, and you're right. Just to end on kind of a super philosophical, like, why are we even talking about this note? It yeah. will blur the lines. Like, today, you could ask yourself a question, what is reality? Oh, How wow. do we know? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't want to really bring this up. It's like first-year some- epistemology lessons. But I'm back is, to I mean, my I philosophy. You, <laughs> but I know you think this is really silly, but it just is what it is. Like, ha, tell me, you've tell me, there's not a like an intellectual right. being out there who has yeah. never asked themselves, like, is this just a big experiment? Is this some kind of augmented reality? And if it's not reality, what is reality? Type of yeah, sort yeah. of very French philosophical type of thing. But anyway, yeah, I like it. It's good, and it pays to go down those avenues once in a while because it helps put us in place. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Michael, that was really interesting. I like it. I like it a lot. And there's a lot more to talk about, which we will continue to do. And I think we'll do it in the context of other verticals as well. And, you know, the other thing, too, is as we move on with the ATP stories, I think we'll run into a whole bunch of people that are on the cutting edge of developing this type of augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality stuff. And, you know, we'll be able to talk to them, and then you and I will be more informed about it. We'll be able to talk to each other about it. And I think that's one of the other great things about the ATP stories is that it allows us to get somebody else's perspective and then go through again and rediscuss things that interest both of us. And I think that's really fascinating and powerful. Yeah. And it's going to be something that we didn't expect, isn't it? It's going to be an yeah. application which you thought, wow, I didn't think of that. No. And I think that's one of the greatest things about doing this, to be fair. Anyway, thank you very much for tonight. Really yeah. interesting stuff. It was really interesting. It's a good subject way out there, I think, in terms of, you know, the, the common scope of what we talk about, but I, I think that's important. I think so too. We're pushing the envelope a little bit, and it's good. If anybody's out there who has experience or some sort of feedback on the conversation tonight, whether you agree, disagree with us, whether you have some sort of point that you want to share with us, maybe some inside information, insight that we don't, we don't know about. We don't know everything here. You can, you can tweet us, Asia Tech Pod, or hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. You can catch us Facebook slash Asia Tech Podcast or on the website www.asiatechpodcast.com and go and check out the tour as well because we are visiting Asia and we're going to go and have a look at 
the real Asia, the reality of what's going on out there. Um, <laughs> exactly. AR, VR, mixed reality, real reality, whatever. As Michael says, what is reality anyway? We'll be there offline. <laughs> we'll talking be there to the people. Team. Exactly. Doing the, the VR, AR stuff in the real world. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.